everyone and welcome to our week 2 video 2.3 online learning as blended delivery and this is for the course online learning theories and models just to start off with some analysis questions as we get into looking at blended learning start thinking about from your experience what are some components of blended learning and how do they relate to each other or not and when is online learning not a blend and then depending on your background and your experience, think about what counts as a blend. Is it the same across different sectors? So before we jump into some definitions, I'd just like to spend a little bit of time looking at the importance of blended learning. So the quote on the screen is from 2002. And it's the president from Penn State saying that the single greatest unrecognized trend in higher ed today was blended learning. And then if we jump forward to more current dates, why? As of 2011, the number of higher ed students taking at least one online course in the U.S. is greater than 6 million. That's just in the U.S. and just higher ed. So when you start looking at the K-12 numbers in the U.S. as well as Canada, um, it's easily exceeding the 10 million mark. 65% of higher ed institutions now say that online learning is a critical part of their long-term strategy. And that's from the Sloan Consortium. The Sloan Consortium publication, Going the Distance, 20, uh, 2011, is, uh, is a useful read when you have time. Um, and there is also a Canadian, rough Canadian counterpart that we'll get to with some K-12 links. I've also put a link on the bottom there uh, to the New Learning Institute film series, and it is fantastic. The focus is both K-12 and higher ed, um, but the message is really valuable. This particular link is around technology and 21st century learning, which again makes the argument for introducing and supporting a blended learning model in all of our learning, whether it's K-12, higher ed, corporate, or government, or beyond. So blended learning also has, like most things in education, many names. Um, it's been called hybrid learning, integrative learning, multi-method learning, multimodal learning. And I've put here a really solid resource for you to take a look at around blended learning. It's from Penn State. It's an open web course um, that basically walks you through what is blended learning, why would you do it, advantages, disadvantages, challenges, and is most current with the research. So this is a fantastic resource and it'll be something that'll be useful as you get into your problem-based learning. So pulling from some of these articles, now these are, are dated 2003 and um, they're ones that have been found, um, hidden somewhere. They're actually part of a book chapter that evolved later on. Uh, but looking at three common definitions, so a blend at the time in 2003, you could combine your instructional modalities, so the delivery media, so computer, face-to-face, -face, um, or synchronous, asynchronous. Uh, you could also blend by combining instructional methods. And then you could blend by combining face-to-face -face and online. So that was at the time in 2003 some common sort of big picture visions of what blended learning was. The article that's in your readings, the Staker and Horn article, classifying K-12 blended learning, again it's U.S. Uh, publication, um, but one of the definitions and the way they're approaching blended learning in that article is one that's gathering a lot of steam in um, the literature and in practice. So they distinguish it as a formal education program. So not something you know you're doing just as uh, educational gaming or something like that. This is a f you've entered into a formal course, so to speak, in which the student learns at least in part through online delivery of the content and instruction with some element of student control of time, pace, place, or path. And it's somewhat supervised in a brick and mortar location away from home. There are a variety of levels of blended learning and in um, Curtis Bonk and Christopher Graham's book, The Handbook of Blended Learning, they talk about four different levels activity level, course level, program, and institutional level. They're coming at it from more of a higher ed and corporate stance. And what I've done is I've put two links here. 
The first link is a, a link to a draft of chapter one of that book, and the second link is a link to the revised version that's coming out for 2013. Uh, it has some pieces missing, it's a, a Google Books link, but it will give you a sense of the overall book and talks nicely about some of the future directions at the end. So let's talk quickly about some advantages of blended learning. And this is again pulled right from the, the Bonk and Graham chapter, there's a pedagogical richness to it. So many people have termed blended learning as the best of both worlds uh, because you get the chance to reflect as well as be part of a synchronous setting um, where you're in some cases seeing body language, in other cases hearing it. Um, access to knowledge is an increased flexibility of it. So you're no longer having to wait till you get to a physical location to have the knowledge imparted upon you. You can do some sourcing and sifting of knowledge prior to that, much like what you do in this course. The uh, social interaction aspect of blended learning. So as opposed to just asynchronous discussion where you're relying heavily on text or perhaps an audio file link, um, here you're definitely getting that social interaction and the sense of personal agency. Institutionally, uh, there's a sense of cost effectiveness. So, for example, in British Columbia, several of the large school districts uh, have trouble just with their actual physical plant locations. They're actually brick and mortar buildings can't house the number of students that need to go through them in a day. So moving to a blended model, in some cases a flipped classroom model, has allowed them to maximize the, the actual physical structure required and uh, as well be able to reach more students in a cost-effective way. And then also the ease of revision. Depending on how you've designed the course, um, that can be uh, greater or less. Some of the challenges with blended learning the role of live interaction. When do you do it? How do you do it? Why do you do it? Uh, so this again comes back to some design assumptions around your program or your course or your activity with the blend. Uh, the role of learner choice and self-regulation. How much of that plays into the blended learning decisions? Do you allow learners to choose when they're going to blend? If so, how much? And the Staker and Horn article talks about that, as does the Bonk and Graham one. And then models for support and training. Um, blended learning, while it seems to make complete sense to most people, um, does bring with it a new skill set that's required, both for instructors, for students, and for institutions. So models to support and train all of those different audience groups are required. Of course, the ongoing challenge with blended and online learning is the digital divide. Uh, blended learning does require that you will have a certain level of access to a certain type of technology, depending on what the, the program, course, or activity has decided. And so there's the potential for individual, digital divide there. One other challenge that is increasingly rising in the literature is the notion of cultural adaptation. So blended learning, and depending on how the courses have been designed, I'll use higher ed for an example, um, generally does do result in a lot of group work, a lot of participation, and in synchronous sessions, a lot of um, immediate responses, which depending on your cultural orientation and your cultural upbringing, may or may not be something that's comfortable for you. So for example, when I teach in China, um, blended learning is something that we work quite a bit with in terms of preparing the students for what's expected. Um, in China, some of the cultural requirements would dictate that certain people wouldn't speak unless spoken to directly. Uh, they would defer to their elders. They would defer to perhaps gen based on gender. And so there are some cultural adaptations that need to be considered within blended learning in order for the learning experience to be authentic for everyone. And then the last challenge is around how much do you innovate versus how much do you just produce a course that's sustainable and, um, and solid. And so striking that balance between constantly being on the bleeding edge um, with your course or your program and being able to create something that's sustainable and scalable. Corporate uh, definitely wrestles with that balance around innovation and scalability. So what are some future trends? And again, I've put the last chapter of the Bonk uh, 
at all book there. This is going to be a 2013 publication. And so there's some really interesting trends. These are pulled right from that chapter. Um, a trend around mobile blended learning, self-determined, increasing the connectedness and sense of community, increasing the authenticity, both within the blend but within assignments, within that interaction with the content, connection back to your work and learning. With respect to higher ed and to corporate, sort of a change in how you calendarize your training and your courses. Also predicting uh, some course designations for blended learning. So in your timetable at a higher ed institution, you actually would have a course designated as blended. Instructor roles would be changed, and you'd see an emergence of blended learning specialists. So these are some of the trends that they're either seeing now or predicting will come. And this is, again, from that link at the bottom, which I would encourage you to take a look at. So to synthesize this very quick overview on blended learning, um, two questions to think about. What do the trends, as we've just quickly gone through and identified in the Bonk et al. link, mean to you in your sector? Where is your sector with respect to those trends? Are you at the front end of broaching this? Are you have already been down a path and there's uh, a bit of a history with blended learning? Where do these trends fall and resonate with you? And then the second question is, have we reached a point where there's no point in creating a learning environment that's not a blend? Why and why not? So we'll spend some time in our tutorial talking around some of these synthesis questions, and I'm interested in hearing your thoughts and comments on them. Thanks very much, and have a great day.